tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The deadline to temporarily move has come and gone. Get inside the fence! And, and now we're just dealing with a few who um, need a little bit more help uh, to move along. I just want everybody to remember this is uh, everybody's human down here. The Crab Park cleanup started today, but not without some heated moments between city crews and those living there. Plus, commuters brace for a big closure. The Expo line will terminate at Surrey Central Station during this work. TransLink is getting ready to shut down the King George SkyTrain station for six weeks for maintenance work. Also, cruise ships will soon be back in Nanaimo. I think it's fantastic. It's a great opportunity for our economy to introduce more tourists to the area. After a years-long hiatus, locals are hopeful the industry's return will trigger a swell in tourism spending. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Well, the deadline for people living in Vancouver's Crab Park to temporarily relocate has come and gone. Police and park rangers descended on the encampment this morning, marking the beginning of what's being called a cleanup of the area. But as John Hernandez reports, many residents were not ready to leave today and tensions boiled over. Get inside the the tent city residents found themselves cut off from their shelters Monday morning. The encampment surrounded by a fence put up by city staff and guarded by police and park rangers. I just want everybody to remember this is uh, everybody's human down here. Last week, residents were given notice to relocate their belongings to a temporary camping area nearby so city crews could clean up the encampment. Park officials said they consulted with residents, citing concerns over syringes, feces and rats. Yeah, I think through those conversations we've devised a plan um, that, that worked for most and, and now we're just dealing with a few who um, need a little bit more help uh, to move along. The vast majority of shelters were still standing by the imposed deadline. Confusion and anxiety as some residents tried to get back in to retrieve belongings but were kept out. It's a, just a really deplorable, egregious waste of money and resources. It's really inhumane. The encampment has been in place for years after a B.C. court ruled residents couldn't be evicted because of a lack of shelters in the city. Residents have since built a warming hut, even a kitchen, but fear they'll both be destroyed during the cleanup. I think that they're hoping for everybody to um, disband and just like go off on their own separate ways. The park board says the structures are too dangerous to remove by hand. So there will be some heavy equipment on site uh, to do the cleanup. Um, and then we'll level the land and I believe the intention is to layer some gravel and, and rocks. So. For people having, who've lived here for years or months having to witness this today is really traumatizing. Calls for an alternative community-led cleanup have fallen on deaf ears. The city says the structure removal will take at least one week before allowing residents back in. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, preparations are being made to close King George SkyTrain Station for six weeks for repair work. Starting late next month, the Expo Line will temporarily end at Surrey Central Station. Both stations see upwards of 11,000 commuters every day. TransLink says the plans are in the works to mitigate the disruptions. We'll have extra bus service every 15 minutes between 6 and 9 a.m. on weekdays. So that will help alleviate a lot of the crowding where people that normally take the SkyTrain from King George, because the station being closed, they'll have that extra bus service in the morning. TransLink says it will ramp up service during the morning rush hour since the busy periods for the commute home are more spread out. The station is being closed so crews can remove a piece of rail line and replace a mechanical device that guides the trains from one track to another. This section of track has been in use since the station first opened three decades ago. TransLink is also planning to do a number of other upgrades at the same time. A Delta business owner is desperate after a shipping container full of e-bikes worth a combined half million dollars was stolen last week. The thieves used a semi to make a midnight heist. The container itself has since been recovered in Langley, but as Saurabh Sandhu reports, the dozens of bikes that were inside are still missing. 
it has a new improved motor. A brand new e-bike design equipped with the latest technology with a sticker price of more than $5,000. It's a brand new style of bike. But on March 19th, the team behind the bike received shocking news when 144 of these e-bikes went missing from outside a Delta warehouse. We get a call from an employee at the, at the warehouse saying, hey, I'm standing here with the police, your container has been stolen. And, and, and that really just shattered our hearts. The company posted surveillance video of the theft online. Delta police confirmed two suspects, a man and a woman, drove a semi-tractor into an insecure warehouse lot on NSS Island around 1 a.m. They hooked up to a shipping container carrying the electric bikes and drove away within minutes. On Friday, Bike Trick says they were told the stolen container had been found in Langley, but empty. We have a few different containers coming, and this particular one was of super importance to us because uh, A, it's a brand new model of bike that we've been working on for a long time, uh, and we've pre-sold most of that container. Plus, this container also had about eight of our prototype bikes. Thomas says the loss is made worse because the goods were not under Bike Trick's control, so they have to rely on the warehouse's insurance. I've made a video on it with the hope that if somebody spots them, then somebody can be notified. This isn't fluke. This was organized. It was thought out. Rob Brunt has been at the forefront of Project 5 to 9 for almost 10 years, an initiative aimed at recovering stolen bikes. He's pretty hopeful some of them could be recovered. You know, they end up, that container ends up in Toronto and it hits the market in Toronto and, and they're registered stolen on 5 to 9. When the public starts to register again, it will flag those bicycles. Delta police say they're actively investigating the theft and are attempting to recover the stolen property. And while Thomas hopes the goods will be recovered, his focus on serving his customers, several of whom have agreed to wait a few more months to get the bikes they already purchased. Saurabh so Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the province is handing out $24 million to communities that want to improve their wa walking and cycling infrastructure by building multi-use pathways, protected bike lanes and pedestrian bridges. With this BC Active Transportation funding, we are reshaping the future of transportation and critical connections on active school routes here in Souk. This funding and these improvements will not only enhance connectivity, but also promote safety and accessibility for our community. So far, the province has fronted nearly 300 similar projects through the funding over the last five years. There is anger broiling on the North Shore over a perceived lack of transparency and accountability. Turns out many households will wind up paying roughly $20,000 over the next three decades, all for the completion of a much-delayed wastewater treatment plant. That project has been mired in controversy and huge cost overruns. As Janella Hamilton reports, the price tag has more than quadrupled since construction began. Ten years after the project was first announced, the North Shore Wastewater Treatment Plant is not even 30% complete and more than five times the projected budget. The new price tag, $3.86 billion. This is a colossal headache. The much-delayed project hit major roadblocks in 2022 when Metro Vancouver ended its contract with Axiona, the Spain-based company responsible for designing and building the plant. There were 1,500 deficiencies found. Uh, I've physically been in there and been shown the deficiencies. Mind-blowing. To finally get the job done, Metro Vancouver says the average household on the North Shore will have to pay an extra $725 every year over 30 years through increases to utility and property taxes. In the case of homeowners, well, it just keeps going up year after year after year. And incidentally, in 2024, North Vancouver District, where I live, has seen the biggest tax increases. The existing sewage plant near the Lionsgate Bridge has reached the end of its life and only provides primary treatment. Federal law now requires facilities to also remove microplastics. We need the federal and provincial governments to step up and provide more funding. 
Metro Vancouver and Axiona are also embroiled in a lengthy legal dispute. This expert says taxpayers will likely end up covering some of those costs too. It's unacceptable for these kinds of things to happen behind closed doors. When billions of taxpayer dollars are on the hook, taxpayers deserve accountability and transparency. I'm calling on the provincial government to have a forensic audit because we all need to know what went wrong so it doesn't happen again. They're both calling for better provincial oversight of major projects like this one that involve taxpayer dollars. Metro Vancouver says PCL construction has taken over the project, which is now set to be up and running by 2030. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, North Vancouver. With 13 FIFA World Cup matches slated for Canada in 2026, the Federal Competition Bureau has unveiled a digital tip line to report suspected collusion. It's meant to help deter and detect illegal agreements. I want to ensure that, um, you know, like the, these types of, um, of events are, are actually held, uh, uh, you know, at the best value for money possible and that uh, consumer have confidence in the marketplace uh, when, uh, when, these t we, when these types of, uh, of events are actually, are actually happening. The tip line is part of a joint initiative by the Competition Bureau, the U.S. Justice Department, and Mexico's Federal Economic Competition Commission. Let's bring in our Darius Madavi for a look at the forecast. And Darius, looking outside right now, you almost forgot what a nice, beautiful, sunshine, warm day we had yesterday. Yeah, it's been a, a bit of a mix of everything last week, and it's going to be again this week. Now, even though it was uh, pouring rain in downtown Vancouver just an hour ago, at the same time, it was actually sunny in Kit. So it really depends where you are, what kind of weather you're getting. Uh, it's much brighter in some places than others. I know there was also some sun in the valley earlier. Uh, so really depends where you are, what you're going to get. We saw plenty of precipitation in many places. Uh, and again, these are just showers. So even if they are heavy for a little bit, they're just pretty short lived. So they're popping in and out. So uh, not looking at too much until Wednesday when we see that more serious uh, wave of rain come through and even there's just periods of rain should be uh, just a few hours of it before we clear up uh, not clear up but dry up a little bit again Thursday is also a little bit wetter as that unsettled air mass sits over the province uh, but tomorrow though a little bit of precipitation still probably early in the morning and late in the evening uh, but in between we should see some sunshine as well probably late tomorrow afternoon so as you can see here uh, some snow also for the mountains especially Wednesday those freezing levels coming down as well as the temperature so a little bit cooler for Vancouver back into the single digits eight or nine degrees by the water but that also means those freezing levels are down so some snow for the mountains uh, as for tonight it is a full moon as you can see there but also we've got plenty more showers on the way. Probably going to be a little bit difficult to see that full moon tomorrow. Maybe you have a little bit of a better shot as that sun comes out tomorrow in the afternoon. Okay, we'll talk to you again a little bit later in the show. Thanks, Darius. Thank you. A necropsy is being done today to examine the death of a killer whale off Vancouver Island. She became beached over the weekend and wound up drowning despite a mass community effort to save her. Now the race is on to save the mother's orca calf. Our Stephanie Mercier shows us how locals and experts alike are trying to help the orphan. An orca calf swimming for survival off northern Vancouver Island. It's stayed near its mother a day after she became beached in an inlet near Zabalis, an area known for fast changing tides. She was likely in pursuit of uh, a harbor seal and um, unfortunately she ended up rolling over on her side. So when the tide came in, uh, she drowned despite the best efforts of locals to refloat her. The whale was giving a really big fight. Florence Bruce was one of the group who waded into the waters trying to push the whale back to sea. It was moving its tail trying to help us too but she ended up passing away. Biologists say they knew the 14-year-old orca. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans is now investigating her death and trying to save the life of her calf, just under two years old, left orphaned. Fortunately, it's making a lot of loud calls and uh, if if it can swim out on its own at high tide, or uh, if it needs us uh, to help it out, well, once it's out in open water, it can continue to call. If the calf is going to survive, it will need a way out of the inlet and then find its extended family. Researchers are looking around for nearby pods. Well, the thing with killer whales is that uh, 
they're they're very much like us in uh, their lifespans and their family bonds. And we also know these whales very well. Meanwhile, those who tried to save the mother orca mourn. I'm so sad inside. It's kind of like I lost a relative, which because our First Nations people are so close to our land and our animals, right? Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. The port of Nanaimo is preparing to welcome cruise ships again for the first time since 2019. As Claire Palmer tells us, there are high hopes it'll trigger a growth spurt in the local tourism industry. It's all hands on deck in Nanaimo as the port makes preparations to welcome the Seaborne Odyssey and MS Regatta to the docks. We've got the space, we've got the availability. We, Our residents are keen to see the ships here and welcome the, the tourists. A cruise terminal and dock was set up back in 2011 to drive economic development in Nanaimo, planned for use by cruise ships like this one back in 2019. The goal was to see 25 to 30 ships a year, but Nanaimo hasn't seen any cruises since the pandemic cancelled all six planned stops in 2020. The return has excited locals as Nanaimo continues to develop its tourism industry. The optimism was very high. Uh, two cruise ships in a year is very good, but uh, much like Oliver Twist, I think it's fair to say we want some more. The focus will be on bringing smaller ships to town and offering a unique and intimate experience. Cruise guests will be able to explore Nanaimo's waterfront, museums and breweries. Thomas says that there will also be excursion packages for local wineries and trips to areas like Cathedral Grove. Well, it's a huge impact for the local economy from a tourism perspective. I mean... Passengers get off cruise ships and they've got money burning a hole in their pocket and they want to spend it at our local businesses. Local businesses are excited at the prospect. The tourists really enjoy our waterfront and so having the cruise ships be a part of that just makes it that much richer for all of us. Residents in Nanaimo say bring it on. We introduce more tourists to the area because uh, we need more people downtown spending money. It's a beautiful spot. Welcome to Nanaimo. <laughs> gives the smaller center some, you know, more interest. But my other thought is the traffic. I, I mean, it's all great if people come off the ships and stay local. The port already has four ships booked for the 2025 season and two more for 2026. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. Up next, consuming scoops of protein powder and raw organ meats, extreme bodybuilding and more. These so-called health trends specifically target men on social media. Our live guest will delve into the potential harms behind them after the break. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream. The Junos took place last night in Halifax. Snotty-nosed Rez Kids, a band from BC's Heisla First Nation, were nominated for two Juno Awards. Our Dan Burrett spoke with one of the band members about the Indigenous representation at the awards show last night. You didn't win, hate to say, but you have won many Junos in the past. Uh, what stood out for you from last night? Um, it was just... Uh, the biggest thing for me was seeing the representation on behalf of the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, our first Junos in 2019, it was just us in the Indigenous category, which was like, I don't know, four or five. Mm -hmm. Four or five of us. Six, maybe. And, like, you fast forward to this year, and there was 38 of us nominated outside of the category you know what i mean so you love to see, you love to see the growth obviously it wasn't going to happen overnight but it's gradually happening and you just love to see it mm -hmm. and there were some fabulous uh performances last night what was it oh for sure uh, what was it like to be in that room for that tribute to robbie robertson with ace and allison russell i mean william prince many guests mm. it was beautiful man uh I tend to stay off my phone in mm. moments like that because I just want to just embrace it in full as it is. And it was beautiful, man. And it just goes to show, like, the doors that he knocked down for artists like them and us to be able to do what we do. You mm. know what I mean? So it was beautiful. What does it say that you've gone from what you said years ago around six nominations now to 38 but that moment where uh it was acknowledged 
that Robbie had to hide his indigeneity for so long, mm -hmm. so many decades ago. And when he, when mm -hmm. he chose to reveal it, that, those were on his terms. But what a progression that has been, albeit a long time. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show like how the times are changing. Whereas mm -hmm. like you look at, you look at us, like me and my brother, we came out the gate be like, nah, this is who we are. Yep. We ain't hiding, we're, we're not hiding anything. This is who we are. You get us in full. So it just goes to show like how much has changed over the years and you know big ups to him man i'm glad he finally got the the love and respect that he rightfully deserved Health trends on social media are always changing to find a niche audience, and one of those areas is men's health and fitness. Much of that content focuses on gym tips and dieting, with creators like the Liver King on TikTok telling men to eat large amounts of raw organ meats to help gain muscle, and others like Joey Swole giving tips on how to improve exercise form. Well, Paul Sharp is a UBC Research Fellow with the Men's Health Research Program. He joins us now from Sydney, Australia, where he does some of his work, uh, to chat about these trends. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. So we'll get right to it. Are there risks to following health advice like excessive bodybuilding and extreme supplement intake? And, and can those also be beneficial? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess the first thing that I'll say about that is that I'm a huge proponent for regular exercise and maintaining a healthy, balanced diet, um, not only for the health benefits of it, but for men, there can be improvements in self-confidence. It can be a way to reduce stress, um, and it can also be a social activity to get together with other guys. The issue comes around social media, and what we see from the research is that a lot of the health information shared online is either misleading or not founded in evidence. Um, and we need to keep coming back to the idea that these social media influencers are often being sensational and over-the-top personas because they're trying to sell a brand. Um, you know, if we look at the example of the liver king, he started on social media to um, sell his supplement brand. So we see this increase that men are now turning to these muscle building supplements, things like whey protein, creatine, pre-workouts, um, to help them achieve their fitness goals. And in Canada, these are classified as natural health products, which is largely an under-regulated industry. Um, and for most people, they end up self-prescribing and self-dosing their own supplements. So this can have an individual response. There can also be interactions between the supplements that we're taking um, or other medications that an individual might be taking as well. Mm. So while we often associate this muscularity with health, there is the potential for adverse health effects. It can have a strain on our internal systems and organs. And we see this with some high profile cases of um, seemingly healthy bodybuilders that are passing away too young. Men's health trends are sometimes branded as, as a lifestyle that goes beyond a person's health. How are these trends changing the way we define masculinity? Yeah, it's so interesting because these influences are all around us. They're social influences that tell us what our body should look like. Um, they tell us essentially what it means to be a man. And in the past 20 years, the dominant body ideal for men has shifted towards increased muscularity. It has an emphasis on kind of um, lean bodies, fat-free mass, um, and we're seeing a corresponding rise in muscle, dysmor uh, muscle dysmorphia sorry, among men. Um, so social media can really perpetuate these unrealistic and ultimately unattainable ideals 
um, that is leading to disordered eating, excessive exercising, and anabolic steroid use. The Liver King himself, despite having this kind of back to the basics, all natural brand, has actually admitted to taking performance enhancing drugs to achieve his physique. There's a lot to this, you're right, from the marketing to the psychology behind it, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your expertise today. Thank you very much. Paul Sharp is a UBC Research Fellow with the Men's Health Research Program. Still ahead, Russia's president claims the West is at fault for this weekend's mass attack that left more than 100 dead, despite ISIS claiming responsibility. We'll have that story next. Iftar, it's, a, it's where we break our fast for all the Muslims here. So any Muslim here on the island that's doing their fast and all that, they're welcome to join us. Ramadan might seem for a lot of people that might not be and like common, like it's not something that you, they're used to. Their first thought is, oh, there are a bunch of people that are not eating or drinking anything from sunrise to sunset. There's a lot of meanings behind Ramadan that uh, a lot of people won't understand until they experience it themselves. Ramadan proves for all of us that we can go through something as difficult as uh, fasting, a dry fast for a long period of time. And it gives us a lot of other benefits and experiences that we might not otherwise get without the Ramadan. So here at the mosque, uh, the management organizes uh, uh, the food for the people who are studying or who are bu busy with, uh, with their lives. For me, my family is in India. So that's why I don't have anybody at home. So I feel like when I come here, it feels like we are a family together and it feels really good. Uh, we have a big international community here in PI. We have a lot of people that uh, don't necessarily are, uh, are not here necessarily with their family. So it's, it's a kind of a requirement for us to make them feel like they are a part of the family. So we try and do our best there. I've been here without my family for five years now. And uh, I come from a culture where the, especially the first day of Ramadan, it's a big celebration. It's the whole family gets together, everyone kind of sits around the table and enjoys the time and we spend the whole day with each other up to sunrise where we uh, then prepare for to fast again. Uh, so coming here to the island, you kind of lose a bit of that, but eventually you kind of find the community to fit in, to kind of replace it. Uh, obviously it's not going to replace 100%, but it does the job. Especially when I moved here at first time, uh, I didn't know anybody here. And when I, uh, when I came to the mosque and saw people here, I made connection. It helped me academically, professionally, and uh, it really helps to uh, understand the, the beautiful uh, island and, the, and its people and the culture. Welcome back. Let's take you to our province next door where that government is launching several investigations. It comes after CBC News revealed some vulnerable patients were being discharged to hotels instead of properly staffed care facilities. Julia Wong has the latest. More than two dozen people, many vulnerable, some discharged from hospital, were sent to this hotel, including Chris Semkin's nephew, who is autistic and has high needs. Initially shocked and the news reports, I was 
very concerned. Thanks for coming. Now, the province says the vast majority of the group has been moved to an apartment building and is getting proper support. Over the past 72 hours, Alberta Health and AHS arranged for a mobile health unit, which included a nurse practitioner and paramedic, to offer on-site assessments to all clients. The Alberta government is launching four investigations into the agency that put people into the hotel, Contentment Social Services. The government will look at possible elder abuse and neglect and possible misuse of government income supports and more. And says the government... That I've instructed Alberta Health Services and any of my department not to interact with this particular agency. Alberta's action comes after CBC News first broke the story more than a week ago of Blair Caniff, who had been in hospital waiting for a care home and wound up at a travel lodge instead. The Alberta government is now looking at regulating agencies like contentment. Why didn't the government have oversight on this to start with? So they're saying, hey, come live with us here or come live with our organization and we will provide services beyond housing. That is relatively new uh, for what has taken place in the province and that's why we're going to uh, look at regulating that gap. This health law expert says the province is fixing a problem it created. And this case really illustrates the challenges with discharging patients and the fact that that's something that government really ought to have been vigilant about. Chris Semkin says more oversight is clearly necessary. Hopefully they take care of it now and actually see to it that these people are taken care of properly. Overseas, seven people have so far appeared in court in connection with Friday's deadly attack at a Moscow concert hall. A faction of ISIS, the Islamic State group, has claimed responsibility. But as Briar Stewart reports, Russia's president is casting suspicion on Ukraine and the West as well. And a warning, some may find the images in this story disturbing. The faces of the four alleged gunmen tell the story of their arrest and what happened afterwards. They appeared in court bruised, beaten and barely conscious. Late Monday, three others also appeared accused of being complicit in the attack on a Moscow concert hall that left more than 130 dead. For the first time, Russia's president described the attackers as radical Islamists, but suggested Ukraine and the West could also have been involved. This atrocity may be just a link in a whole series of attempts by those who've been at war with our country since 2014, he said. The group ISIS-K, an offshoot of Islamic State, has claimed responsibility. It carried out a suicide bombing at the Kabul airport in 2021 and recently staged attacks in Iran and Turkey. Germany says it stopped the group from targeting a cathedral on New Year's Eve. And France's president said police there had also foiled planned attacks. We have offered to increase cooperation with Russia's intelligence services and our partners in the region, said Emmanuel Macron. France raised its terror threat to the highest level. And Italy has stepped up security ahead of Easter. So we are seeing an upscaling by ISIS operations. This international terrorism expert says Russia is a target of jihadi groups in part because it fought in Syria alongside the government against ISIS. With the expansion of uh, ISIS-K, they have been increasingly trying to tap into communities in Central Asia, but also Central Asian communities in Russia. And the way they go about doing it is predominantly online through encrypted messaging apps. The suspected gunmen are all from Tajikistan. Russia has said they were arrested while on their way to Ukraine. Ukraine and the U.S. have dismissed those claims as propaganda. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Elsewhere overseas, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. abstained from today's vote, which angered Israel's prime minister. The CBC's Sally Patterson is that story. 
United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres spent his weekend at the Gaza border, renewing his calls for a ceasefire there, as more than a million people face starvation in the Strip. And now the UN Security Council has passed a resolution echoing those calls, after several previous attempts to do so over the past five months have failed. On Monday, the Council rejected an amendment proposed by Russia that would have called for a permanent ceasefire, but it backed the draft as a whole, calling for an immediate one. Speaking after the vote, China made a point of reminding Security Council members that resolutions are binding and the Council could use enforcement measures if parties don't abide by them. But in her statement, the United States representative at the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, called this a non-binding resolution, leading to questions over what impact Monday's vote will really have. The US, UK and Israel all condemned the fact that the text doesn't explicitly condemn Hamas's attacks on Israel on October 7th, which left 1,200 people dead and more than 200 taken hostage. The US, though, didn't use its veto vote to stop the text in its tracks, which went down badly with Israel. In response, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled a visit by his senior advisers to the White House that was due to take place later this week. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says U.S. officials had been looking forward to speaking to them about alternatives to a planned ground offensive in Rafah, which the U.S. doesn't support. Israel maintains Rafah is Hamas's last major stronghold in the Gaza Strip and says it will go ahead with or without Washington's support. Sally Patterson for CBC News, New York. Well, there has been a major shakeup at Boeing. CEO Dave Calhoun will step down at the end of this year. And as the CBC Scott Peterson tells us, it follows weeks of turmoil after a door blew off a Boeing plane midair. There's no secret here that, uh, that Boeing was having trouble with their 737 MAX jets. There was ongoing safety problems, quality control issues. It's also no secret that Boeing 737 MAX is their flagship brand, their best-selling airplanes. So those two factors there, something was bound to give. And this is what we're seeing as far as the CEO now this morning stepping down. Dave Calhoun uh, is leaving at the end of the year. And so for a large company like Boeing, they have to uh, transmit this information to the shareholders, to the public a large time in advance. Now, he's a longtime Boeing director. He started as a CEO in 2020. That was following the return of the 737 MAX to commercial service in wake of those two deadly and fatal accidents and a lengthy global grounding. Now, in a letter to employees today, that door that blew off in midair was, in his words, quote, a watershed moment for Boeing, that the eyes of the world are on us and we will come through this moment, a better company building on the learnings that we've accumulated. Now, also stepping down as part of this up is the head of the commercial aircraft division and the head of the board will not be seeking re-election. So this is a somewhat of a large shakeup for the company as well. And this is, follows a sweeping audit by the FAA just last week identifying say that there was poor quality control issues going on and the safety culture at Boeing needed to be ramped up. And so clearly Boeing responded by saying Mr. Calhoun and under his management as CEO was not acting fast enough. And usually when you have something like this, I mean, Traditionally, shareholders don't like uncertainty, but in this instance here, the shares were up this morning. They opened up about 3% trading, which is a vote of confidence saying that this move by Boeing might just get to these quality controls issues. So there's some optimism there, but Boeing shares so far to this year down 27%, but some optimism that maybe we'll start seeing some more uh, substantial changes with the management at Boeing. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, if you're looking for a book to read over spring break, we hit the streets to find out what Vancouverites are reading right now. We'll have their recommendations after the break. Come over here, girls. Come over here. We are here at Punnel Sports Center. We're having a practice, doing like little battles. We have nine forwards, six defense, and a, and a goalie. 
I'm a defense. I play right wing. I'm center. And I play left wing. So we have uh, players from Charlottetown, uh, Sherwood, Pondle, like Strafford and stuff, and all the Kings County. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big zone, yeah. Those are all my questions. Perfect. It's our last practice of the season, so it's pretty sad. It's very special for us because it's our last practice, so we're not going to see each other next year, or at least some of us. Not on the ice, not like this. No. Since day one, the girls showed up to the practices, work hard, and uh, want to be competitive, creative, and just had so much fun as well doing it. So it's just definitely a year to remember. We won a lot of tournaments, and we had one loss. It was great. I loved playing with them. They're all super great and kind and respectful. It was really fun. Like the best season ever. Yeah, our record was 44-1. Uh, and one. Uh, We were very uh, fortunate to win the three major tournaments over uh, Cross and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and the uh, Sweetheart Tournament PEI. I'm always going to remember the moment where I went to hug Emily, our, the goalie, after the buzzer went off after, for the finals. It just felt amazing. I remember like a few years back, there's probably not enough for a girls team in Palma here. Now you look at here, like there's probably 50, 60 girls in each age group in Palma, right? So I liked that they just made a women's hockey league because it used to only be boys and women couldn't play like professional leagues. I love it because it's just like a chance for women to show how good they are. That's a lot of those girls look up those girls, right? What they see on TV and then that's who they want to be when they get older, right? So it's always awesome to be uh, having dreams and uh, keep working towards them. It's my favorite sport and I just love it. So you, I might be seeing you in the professional hockey league? Possibly. Because I just love to play like professional women's hockey and show all those boys who boss. <laughs> So I know when I really like a song, if within the first three seconds, I'm already vibing to it. Hey, I'm Rohith Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. It's not one person dictating what good music is. It's the community sharing what good music is. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. Well, spring break is here, and for some, that means time to kick back and relax with a good book. Our Michelle Gomez took to the streets to hear recommendations from various Vancouverites. In the midst of spring break, we're asking Vancouverites what they're reading. Here's what they had to say. Gary Snyder, some poetry of Gary Snyder. Some uh, Robert Heinlein, just some science fiction here. And then some more Arthur C. Clarke science fiction. That's about it. It's a very solitary thing. I like being solitary, and I also like being in other people's worlds and seeing how other people think. Like, especially, say, like, H.G. Wells, right? H.G. Wells, 1890, whatever he wrote. He basically predicted a lot of things, like cell phones and all this stuff, right? How does he know that stuff, right? Yeah. So, the themes and things like that, and, like, a lot of people have, you know, like, especially science fiction, it's like, it's all coming to pass now, right? Is it that by? Uh, I think it's Michael Eisinger. Okay, and what do you like about it? It's a shift in your mindset and your perspective. You gotta read it. It was a magazine from the, uh, an ivory. You see, they are very informative. I'm honestly not much of a reader, to be honest. But when I was a kid, uh, my favorite book was The Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And like, I there was like six of them and I read all of them. I'm not a book club, yeah but I don't always read the books. <laughs> 
hard to keep up with it. The last one was Dewar, um, Cloud, something or other. And that was very fascinating. Louise Penny, I just loved. Do you love reading? Oh, yeah. Usually you read nonfiction. I'm reading 12 Trees by Dan Lewis. It's incredible about how to save the earth through these trees. Um, but these are my distraction novels. Honestly, I am reading my Bible and it's the best book ever. <laughs> There's no other reason to read anything else. Psychology of Money, small book. So I started reading it a month ago. Uh, after three chapters, I left the book in my airplane when I was flying in the airplane. So I got another copy because I really like it. I don't know the name in English. Oh, you have it in your bag. Yeah. Mira Kundera. Tracy West, Dragon Masters. Perfect for six to eight. And my granddaughter is an avid reader at eight. And uh, yeah, she, she loves books. Quite a wide range there, very nice. And I have to ask Darius, your favorite book? Oh, uh, The Anthropocene Reviewed. It's like a book of essays and I have uh, like a signed hard copy and the audiobook. and I can't listen to the audiobook while I'm driving because it makes me almost cry every time. Uh, what about you? Wow. What are you reading right now? That's impressive. Right now, um, Bill Browder, that name might be familiar to CBC audience. He uh, is a com it does commentary uh, with us on all things Russia and his own personal experience. It, it's a bio autobiography, but it reads like a political thriller, Red Notice. His uh, <laughs> second book is out, so that's what I'm in the middle of. Very nice. Um, yes, from books to weather, let's uh, see what's let's up. Do it. Looks like we've got some rain, more rain on the way. Some rain, yes, but really just scattered showers. Wednesday is our heaviest rainfall are most consistent, but even that is just a period of a few hours of rain. But for at least us here in Vancouver and really across the south coast of Vancouver Island, the cloud will be pretty heavy from that period from that front moving in until Thursday before it clears up on Friday. So if we take a look, you can see tomorrow really just scattered showers across the board. Depending on where you are, anytime from late morning to early afternoon, you'll see that cloud clear up for us here in Metro Vancouver. It'll probably be around 2 p.m., 3 p.m., somewhere around there. Uh, we're going to see that bigger front move in early morning Wednesday, really break apart here. Freezing levels will come down, which means it'll probably come as snow for the local mountains, which is a bit of good news. Anywhere above uh, probably a snow level of 1,000 meters, so a bit of uh, good news for the mountains here. And then we start to clear up a little bit uh, into Thursday night into Friday. So maybe a glimpse of the sun late Thursday, depending on where you are. For the interior especially, you might get a little bit lucky and get a glimpse then. But for the most part, we're looking at sort of late uh, or the end of this week to really see the sun again after our break in the clouds tomorrow. Now, in terms of wind, that front is also going to bring some strong winds to the west coast of the island as well as the North Island. Maybe a second bit of gusty conditions into uh, Thursday as well. But for the most part, it will be passed on Wednesday. Not sure yet we're going to see a wind warning. Not sure it's quite going to make it to that level, but it could. So on the lookout for that as well. Uh, in terms of our temperatures over the next few days, tomorrow come on, uh, coming up a couple degrees in the south on Thursday, or sorry, Wednesday, falling a little bit and then back up again on Thursday. So not too much excitement there. Still hovering around the 10 degree mark, just a couple degrees above or below. In terms of conditions tomorrow, plenty of scattered showers, some flurries, but pretty much just a small chance everywhere and not looking at anything serious. No in, in uh, high uh, accumulations or anything like that. So I wouldn't worry too much. But if we look at what we've seen on the local mountains recently, some snow and some mixed conditions uh, across the board there. So depending on uh, what, you're, what you're looking at there, uh, a little bit of good news for the days ahead when we should see some more snow as those freezing levels continue to fall. But again, tomorrow, a little bit of sunshine, some rainy periods over the next couple of days. And then as we get into the end of this week, some of that cloud clearing up for some nice bluer skies. Nice to see that right in time for the Easter long weekend. Thanks, Darius. Thank you. Well, Canada's music industry celebrated its biggest and brightest stars last night at the Juno Awards show. The party in Halifax saw dazzling performances, all-star tributes, and even some biting political commentary. The CBC's Eli Glasner has all the highlights. Sometimes at the Junos, a single artist dominates, but this year in Halifax, they spread the love around with Tate McRae, with Toby, with The Beaches, and Charlotte Cardin, each taking home two Junos each. But the show opened in grand style with the return of our host, Nelly Furtado singing a collection of her greatest hits from Man Eater to I'm Like a Bird and more. Like a bird, I 
But let's go back to the beaches. They've been having a remarkable time here in Halifax. They went into the show already having won the Rock Album of the Year Award and beat out the Arkells and Nickelback to take home Group of the Year. An amazing accomplishment for this band from Toronto who had a message for their fans. To all the young girls watching, go start bands with your best friends. Thank you. The show in Halifax was the place for some powerful performances, particularly this tribute to Robbie Robertson. Get your cannonball now to take me down the line. And it was a place for some powerful statements. Tegan and Sarah were honored for their work with LGBTQ youths, and they used their time accepting the humanitarian award to call out the Alberta government with some strong words. And we are dedicated to confronting any form of discrimination that threatens the well-being of our community. <laughs> Threats like the Alberta government's attempt to prevent trans youth from accessing vital care. The show was also a reminder of the expansive variety of the Canadian music scene from Ottawa's talk, Breakthrough Artist of the Year, belting out his song on the Juno stage. To Maestro Fresh West entering the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in style and making history as the first rapper to be inducted. Next year, the party moves to Vancouver. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Halifax. After the break, trucking is a big industry in this province. It's a sector still dominated by men, but this country is seeing a rapid rise in women joining the fleets. We'll hear from some of them next. I'm 
Fortuna und ist hier bei Arsenal. Let's go! Hi, I'm Amy Bell and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On April 13th, join CBC at the Vancouver Vasaki Festival. Drop by the CBC Vancouver tent, say hi, and win some fun CBC prizes. The Vasaki Festival continues in Surrey on April 20th. The event features some of the biggest celebrations outside India with colorful floats, community performers, and live music all rich in culture. More info at cbc.ca slash bc. More women are getting into the trucking industry in Canada. From 2016 to 2021, the number of female truck drivers spiked by nearly 50%. Our Janella Hamilton takes a look at what's behind the growth in a male-dominated sector. And here's from some in BC who are joining the fleets. As a single mom working in film, Willow Heaton was looking for better job stability. It's been a super humbling process, um, learning all of the different things that are involved with this type of trucking. Loaded over 13 down the blackjack. And although she has the companionship of a pretty cute co-pilot, the job doesn't come without its challenges. 75 pounds of triples. I am smaller than most people that work here, so I do have to try harder. I have some workarounds and over time I've gotten stronger. She is among a growing number of women entering the trucking and transportation industry in BC. Jacqueline Mosher began her career 15 years ago, moving product from rail cars into trucks. Hey Chris, where are you located right now? Now she's a division manager at Arrow's Port Coquitlam transfer facility. My daughter's really, really proud of me. And I think that that is even more valuable than the money that I was able to bring into the household. When it comes to truck drivers in particular, a new survey from Trucking HR found the number of female truckers in Canada shot up 43% between 2016 and 2021. We're really working to make sure we retain these women within our sector. So I think we are just on the cusp of some great things and we have economic opportunities available and I think women are seizing those opportunities. Money aside, those in the industry say shift flexibility is one of the driving factors behind the increase. Whether it's uh, working four days on, two days off, whether it's evenings, mornings, whether it's working on the road in a sleeper, having more days off with your family. And while it is still a male-dominated industry with men making up 85% of the workforce in Canada, that's changing. Not knowing if we're going to be able to physically handle it or do it or potentially fail, I think is a little bit intimidating. And I think that a good point is to know that, you know, we understand some of those challenges and we're going to support you. For drivers like Heaton, a career behind the wheel has been very rewarding. One of the best parts about this job is all the off-road driving, which is quite different. I get to see a lot of beautiful places. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Chilliwack. A 95-year-old veteran from Saskatchewan hit the slopes for the first time in eight decades. Eight decades. Wow, Harley Welsh is blind, but with a little help, he was able to sit ski, and CBC was there to capture him in action. <laughs> You're doing great! I was trying to concentrate on the yodeling so I wasn't scared. <laughs> <laughs> what did it feel like? A little bumpy, but uh, yeah, it was great. We have Harley and Mary, and both are residents at Sherbrooke Community Center. Uh, Mary is 93 and is trumped by two years by Harley, who is 95. Um, and they are here today uh, skiing, and this is their first time in the, in the sit ski. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Harley taught me how to yodel. I taught Harley how to sit ski, and it was a beautiful day. This blue skies, perfect conditions, and it was a great time. It provides so much well-being for them. It, this is, this is fun. This is, you know, there's joy and anticipation. There's, it's a lot of work to to lead up to this, and so there's excitement about that. And then, you know, as, as you're seeing today, they're scooting down the hill and it's, it's so much fun. Like you said, you only live once. 
Yep. <laughs> to uh, yep. see their smiles and to hear everyone uh, cheer. Uh, one of the questions we always ask new skiers is, did you ever picture yourself doing this? And uh, they embrace it. It really does take a village to make this happen. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get them off the hill because <laughs> they just keep coming down the hill. Uh, so this is just a really wonderful day. Well, I was trying to yell, but <laughs> it got a little squeaky sometimes. So, sometimes it was closer. Wow, 95 years old. Good for him. That's impressive. And also just as impressive as just that uh, ski hill in Saskatchewan. I didn't know they had <laughs> ski hills like that there, but... Yeah, I'm pretty go. sure if you stand at the uh, one edge of Saskatchewan, you mm -hmm. can see the other side. <laughs> so I don't know where that ski hill is. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on GEM as well as on YouTube and our website. We'll be back with your next local news at 11 o'clock right after the National. Good night. Good night.